I was out having a smoke behind the dorm when one of the orderlies came up and asked if I could spare one. I'm not one of those hard-ass CEOs. Hell, I know guys that would have locked him up just for asking. But I'm not about making their lives more difficult than they have to be, or making more work for myself. I'm not quite what you'd call a career man, but I'm not some go-nowhere guy either. I'm solidly middle of the road, take my opportunities where they come, and it's led me to have a rapport with these guys who call Stragview their home. These guys can spot a softie from a mile away, and it usually leads to them telling me things. Things they maybe wouldn't tell other COs. Things like where the knives are hidden that might be meant for them, where the drugs are that might get them hemmed up, which one of their enemies is cooking buck, and sometimes even stories about their past. Tonight was one of those times. I scoffed at him, telling him I could lose my job for that, and that's when he offered me a deal. Well, what if I told you a story, something real good, like how I got 25 years for a fucking cat? That piqued my interest, and I fished a cigarette out and held it up. Story first, and if it's any good, then cigarette. He nodded and started talking. The day the cat came up to me, I felt like a rock star. I'd only recently arrived at Stragview, maybe six months ago, and I was prepared to make it my home for the next five years. I've never been a violent guy, I'm a pacifist by nature, but real jobs just never appealed to me. 9 to 5 grind, suit and tie, 401k, no thanks man. I'd known Frankie for years, he was cool, so when he offered me a chance to be a product distribution agent, I was all about it. That was what we called it in the neighborhood. Frankie was never a dope head or a drug pusher, he was a pharmaceutical specialist, and we were his product distribution agents. The cop almost seemed to find that amusing when I told him how it worked after they picked me up. Apparently, I'd been carrying enough drugs to put me away for a long time, but the judge took it easy on me since I was technically my first offense. He gave me five years, three with good behavior, and made it clear that I should consider myself very lucky. Lucky to be going to prison? Fat chance of that. But I went and decided to do my time and maybe learn how to not get caught next time. I saw one ear on my first day here. He's that big orange cat that wanders around the compound. I'm sure you've seen him. The inmates feed him, the guards feed him, hell, I've even seen the warden nod to him. The cat basically runs this place, and he damn well knows it too. The trade-off is that he's feral as hell. No one gets close to old one ear, or they get scratched, or he just kind of runs off. Except for me. I was coming out of the chow hall with a tuna sandwich. It was lunch for that day, along with some other stuff when Officer Moore stepped up for a random frisking search. He found my sandwich, I wasn't really trying to hide it, and dropped it on the ground along with some rubber bands and pocket garbage. He said food was to be eaten in the chow hall, and I said chow was over and they were telling us to leave. He said that wasn't his problem, and I asked him please if I couldn't just take it with me. I knew what he was going to do before he did it. He said sure, all slick like he does, and then he stepped on my sandwich. Oops, he said like a fucking cartoon character, and then just walks off like nothing happened. I picked it up and looked at the boot print on it and decided it was only good for one thing. Old One Ear would have a great lunch today, I guess. So I go over to the queue and line up, and I see him there, standing near the fence as guys throw food at him. He's looking at the bread and cheese and other stuff, and I pinch some sandwich off and throw it to him. He sniffs and bats the bread off munching on the tuna before looking up to see if there was more. I toss some more, and he eats it. The other inmates are looking at me now, asking for some too so they can throw it, but I told them no, this was my sandwich, and I was going to feed this cat. I had started to notice too that old One Ear was coming a little closer every time I threw some sandwich. Closer and closer as the sandwich got smaller and smaller. Finally, as the pieces fell in front of me, he was rubbing my leg and eating the sandwich happily cat looked up at me as I extended a hand. He rubbed his head against it, accepting my attention. At that moment, I felt like a rock star. No one had ever managed to get this close to old One Ear. He would hiss or spit at anyone who got close to him, except for me. When the officer yelled for us to return to our dorm, old One Ear followed me, rubbing my leg and twisting between my feet. The other inmates didn't know what to make of it, and when one tried to reach down and pet him, Old One Ear yowled and scratched his hand. The big lug just pulled his bleeding fingers away, and the others looked at me with a mixture of fear and awe. 
When I got back to the dorm, the cat followed me inside, hopping up onto my bunk and curling up on my pillow. I just sat towards the end of the bunk, looking at him like I couldn't quite believe it was real. Most of the cats on the compound looked mangy, ill-treated, or had signs of disease. Old One Ear had none of these. Other than the missing ear, he was perfect. His coat was short but soft, and when he flopped down on my lap, I was surprised to find that he lacked the crunchy fur that most of the outside cats seemed to have. I spent the afternoon on that first day absent-mindedly petting him, listening to him rumble like a small engine in my lap as the other inmates just watched from a safe distance. When Sergeant Demolo came out to count later, I assumed there would be a problem. Demolo is the brusque and often blustery nighttime sergeant who runs the dorm sometimes, and I could see his bushy eyebrows lifting as he saw the cat. I had seen him take bugs and rats from inmates sometimes, and even taken an inmate's birds once after he caught him raising them in the wreck shed. He had just opened his mouth to ask me what the hell I thought I was doing when old One Ear rolled over and fixed him with a withering look. The guard stopped in his tracks, turned to stone as he stuttered out a question. Is, is, is that old One Ear? I nodded my head absentmindedly as I stroked the cat. Demolo nodded slowly, his head bobbing like a sleepwalker, and then he started on his way again as he shakily counted the others. After that, old One Ear and I were friends, and he slept at the foot of my bed every night. Well, for the next month at least. Old One Ear was never far from my side during those days. The cat followed me everywhere, and no one seemed to stop him. He ate chow with me in the chow hall. He walked the track with me on the rec yard. He sat with me in the library, and he walked the compound with me wherever I went. Even the most grizzled lifer didn't seem to want to get in his way and a couple of new guys who tried were either run off by old one ear or deterred by other inmates. The cat seemed to have an almost talismanic effect on the older inmates, and it's only afterwards that I realized it was fear, not respect, that stopped them. You see, the old timers never feed old one ear. The young guys, the guys like me who haven't been here very long, might feed him, but the old timers never do, and they do their best to ignore him. They tried to warn me about him too, in their own way. The notes started appearing after old One Ear had been with me for about a week. I had noticed some of the lifers and the old timers watching me, and I thought they were impressed, or maybe jealous. The young guys I hung out with were certainly jealous. They had wanted to try and get compound cats of their own, but the female cats hid their kittens very well, and the other cats were downright feral. To my knowledge, well, at this point at least, I was the only person to befriend one of the cats. Certainly the first one to befriend old One Ear, or so I thought. The note was tucked under my pillow, and I started to just throw it away. Notes on or around your pillow are usually best ignored, unless you're looking to be a drug mule or someone's girlfriend. I had so far managed to avoid the attention of the gangs, and the affection of the inmates who engaged in that sort of courtship. But what was written on the note made me stop before tossing it. Don't let the cat see this. Old One Ear meowed, looking at the note questioningly, and I scoffed and told him it was nothing. I crumpled it up and took it to the trash can, slipped it into my pocket instead so I could read it later. I told the cat I was going to the bathroom, the one place it seemed unwilling to follow me, and he meowed and returned to my bunk. The cat was so human sometimes that I didn't think to question it. I hadn't had to deal with pets in quite some time, and I guess I had forgotten how very unhuman they sometimes are. The note was short, but definitely gave me the chills. You don't know me, and I won't name myself just in case that cat is reading over your shoulder. You need to get rid of that animal, and fast. He ain't no normal cat. He picks people sometimes, random people, and never anyone you'd suspect. Then, something happens to them. They get hemmed up with drugs, they get found with a weapon, or they just go off and kill themselves, and that cat is the only constant. I can't prove that he's responsible, but he seems to mark them for strangeness. Destroy this letter after you read it, and if you want more stories, come find me at the card table on the rec yard without your furry friend. Solitaire. I read the note a few more times before peeking around the stall to see if the cat was anywhere around. From the cubicle, I could see him sitting on my bunk, his amber eyes looking at me expectantly. I flushed the note. I couldn't tell you why. It certainly wasn't because I believed the writer, but... It was better to be safe than sorry in here. I pulled my pants up and returned to my furry friend, old one ear rubbing against me as I came within proximity. 
For the next couple of weeks, I thought about the note and what it could mean. I didn't believe it, but what if it was true? Stragview is such a strange place. Sometimes you really can't just say for certain that something is or isn't here. You got guys who claim the tower the warden lives in used to be full of rats, and now he uses them as his spies. You got guys who say the woods are guarded by these big shadow hounds, and that one of them lives in confinement in the quarantine wing. There's talk about ghosts and monsters in the grass that we don't walk on, and how the warden's eyes sometimes glow if you pay attention. I'd never seen any of this, but living inside Stragview makes you wonder if any of it is true or not. Then, one day, I woke up to find that old One-Ear was gone. He did that sometimes, disappearing off to hunt or whatever it was that cats did away from people. I got up and started getting ready for my day, and when the officer called for wreck, he still wasn't back. I went out to wreck with my dorm, feeling the briskness of the February morning through my winter coat, and decided to go for a walk around the track. On my third rotation, I saw the guy playing cards by himself. Us young guys call him Shrek, because he was huge and kind of lumpy looking, but I knew his name was Caldwell, just like I knew well enough not to call him Shrek within his earshot. He was sitting at a table, playing solitaire, looking like someone trying to use kid furniture. The folding chair he was sitting in looked ready to snap, and despite myself, I found I was walking over to talk to him. Caldwell looked up, his face disinterested, but his eyes seemed to sparkle. I had wondered if you'd come to talk to me before it was too late. I sat down across from him, looking around as if expecting a furry shadow to come wandering up then and there. I've been doing a lot of thinking about your note, and I'm curious to know what it means. What were you talking about? Caldwell turned the cards from the deck held in his thick mahogany hand. I've been here a real long time, and in that time, I've seen that cat choose people. Sometimes they get locked up for stuff. Sometimes they end up dead. Sometimes they kill themselves. But it always starts with that cat. But why? What's it got to do with the cat? From the time I came through those gates till now, the only two constants in this place are the warden and old one ear. In all my time here, I've never seen either of them get any older, never look any different than they did the first day I seen them. Compound cats are a dime a dozen, and they die by the dozens too. Old one ear is the exception. Don't trust that cat, not if you have any sense. They started calling for Rek to end then, and Caldwell got ponderously to his feet and went to line up with everyone else. I thought about what he'd said on the way back to the dorm. Caldwell couldn't be right. Cats didn't live more than 20 years. Compound cats are usually lucky to get five, given the environment they live in. For old one ear to have gotten that old, he would have to be some kind of super cat. No, I thought to myself, Caldwell must be wrong. There's no way he could be right. Could he? Old one ear was waiting for me on my bed when I got back. His tail held high and a wrapped snack cake in his mouth. That was the start of old One Ear's little gifts. I never knew where he got them from, but the next two weeks he would show up sometimes with little presents. He brought me snack cakes, cups of soup, even a pack of cigarettes once. No one ever reported any of these things missing, and I never got in trouble for having them. Old One Ear never brought me any of the other gifts that cats usually bring their masters. I never found any dead birds or mice on my pillow. As we smoked the cigarettes that night, hiding out behind food service when we were supposed to be working, my friends spoke jealously about how they wished they had a pet that would bring them cool stuff. They wouldn't think so highly of him after that night, though. When the alarms went off, we all woke up and rolled out of bed to get in our blues. This sort of thing happened sometimes, usually when something bad had happened, and the guards started directing us outside. I grabbed my coat and heard something metal hit the floor. I was going to ignore it, it was probably something I'd knocked off the nightstand, but when the sleeves of my jacket were wet, I turned to see what it had been. Laying next to my bunk was a shank. A shank covered in blood. I scooped it up and stuck it in my pocket. What the hell was this? Why was there a bloody shank in my coat? I looked at the sleeve and decided that it wasn't too badly stained. I tucked my hands in my jacket pockets and saw that it wouldn't show as long as I kept them there. They would probably take us to the yard so they could remove us one dorm at a time while they searched. If we decided to make something of it, the wreck yard was basically one big oval that they could turn into a killing field, and we all knew it. No, my best bet would be to hope they didn't search us before we got there so I could hide this stuff. Hey, you deaf? 
Someone shouted, and I turned to look at him as I got myself right. Get your ass to the wreck yard, now! It was one of the guards, and I stuck my hands in my pocket and hurried out at a brisk walk. They had indeed herded us onto the wreck yard, and as the gates closed, the rumor mill began. I heard it was Clarence from F-Dorm. I heard someone stabbed him over 20 times. They say whoever killed him took his hands. There's no camera footage from that wing. They don't even know who did it. They just know what happened before lunch, and his bunkie just thought to roll him over now. As the masses chattered, I moved up next to my friend CJ and asked if he'd keep a lookout for me. Sure, but what's going on? You trying to catch a smoke? I showed him the knife and his eyes got real big. Holy shit, are you the- I shushed him, his shrill voice making some people turn to look at us. No, but someone's trying to frame me for it. I woke up with this shank in my jacket and I need to get rid of it. Keep a lookout so I can bury it, alright? CJ said he would, and I moved around to the garden shed. The soil was soft there and I figured it would be a while before they found it. I used the shank to slice my name off the coat tag, and then I set to digging a hole. The shovels were locked up for the night, but the soil was extremely soft, and my hands were more than up to the challenge. I expected to be caught any second, but the hole became deeper and deeper as I worked. I had dug six inches before stopping, looking at the hole and deciding that another six inches might be best. Before I knew it, I was crouched over a small two-foot hole, and I wrapped the jacket around the knife before dropping it in. I expected to be caught as I pushed the dirt back in, but still, no one raised an alarm. I shivered as I went back to join CJ, and he gave me a questioning thumbs up. I was cold, but I believed I had wriggled out from under this frame job someone was trying to put on me, at least until they called my name. The captain, a short stocky fellow we all just called Cap or Sir, came to the gate with four bulky officers, Demolo amongst them. They wanted to talk about something they had found on my rack, and they made it clear that they weren't asking for my cooperation. I went meekly enough. They didn't have anything on me. Even if they dug up that knife, my prints wouldn't be the only set on it, and that jacket didn't even have my name on it anymore. It could be any of the blue canvas jackets from around here. They cuffed me and took me back to the dorm, the other inmates silent as the grave. When we arrived, I saw that the dorm had been trashed. Officers are never really neat and tidy while they're looking for things, and the aftermath of the raid is usually spent cleaning up and getting everything back in order. My bunk was towards the back, and the officers were trying to look casual, but it was clear they expected trouble as they moved to let the captain and his entourage take me there. I didn't get it. What the hell had they found? Surely they couldn't have found anything else. On my bunk was old one ear. He was lying on top of a leaking hand, sitting in the middle of my bed, purring softly to himself. I had been so worried about getting rid of the knife that the disappearance of the cat had gone unnoticed. It seemed weird now that he hadn't been there. He had been by my side every day for the past month. Why hadn't I noticed? Why hadn't I looked for him? This your cat? asked the captain, his hand under my arm suddenly tightening like he thought I might lunge at him. Yes, sir, I said. And this is your bunk, right? The captain asked. Yes, sir, but he didn't care. It was straight to confinement after that. I... I wouldn't learn until DR court. But apparently, the cameras in all the dorms had been down for the whole day. They had gotten them back up at 7.30 a.m. the next morning, and not a bit of footage from the previous day could be found. At the time of the murder, I was supposed to be in my dorm, but no one seemed able to confirm this. They could confirm that I was at work at 2.30 p.m. till 6.45 p.m., but since the murder had gone down around lunch, that didn't really clear me of anything. I was held in confinement pending an actual trial, and the courts determined that I was guilty. My public defender did little to dissuade them, and it came down to my word against the evidence. I don't know who told them where I'd hidden the jacket, but they found it and the knife and used it against me. Given that I'd never seen CJ after that, I assumed he was the one that had squealed on me. To my surprise, I was not transferred at a strag view. Most guys who commit a murder in prison are sent off, but I was thrown into the same dorm the murder had happened in and saw my custody level shoot way up. I couldn't work the kitchen anymore. I couldn't participate in the programs I had once been part of. And if it weren't for you guys taking volunteers for orderlies, I'd probably be one of those damn day room zombies you always see watching TV 
and just waiting for Chow. I blew out a deep breath, the M8 holding out his hand for the cigarette. One more question, I said before I passed it over. How do you know it was the cat that nailed you? Cuz, the warden told me, he scoffed. I blinked. He told you the cat had set you up? The M8 nodded. I was sitting in a transport cell as I waited to go to court when I heard a cat meowing from outside the bars. It was old one ear, standing outside the cell. I hadn't seen him since they had taken me to confinement, but when I went to pet him, he hissed and backed away. I just sat there, stunned. Had I offended the damn cat as well? Tough break, said a voice, and the cat turned and batted his head against a familiar set of suit pants. The warden was attached to them, as he usually was, and when he bent down to get the cat, it came willingly into his arms. You should always keep the first rule of prison firmly in your mind, though. Be careful who you trust, and be certain that they trust you. He left then, and though I've seen old one ear again since, I suppose my usefulness to him was up. I gave him the cigarette then, and he smoked it with a look of pure bliss stamped across his face.